Did you know that Michio Kaku released just declassified photos from Venus by the Soviet Union? Hold on to your telescopes, space enthusiasts. These never-before-seen pictures are absolutely out of this world, and rumor has it they reveal some baffling secrets of our torrid neighbor, Venus. What could these decades-old snapshots captured by Soviet lenses tell us about this enigmatic planet? Are we on the brink of redefining our understanding of the universe? Join us as we dive headlong into an interstellar treasure trove with renowned physicist Michio Kaku, unearthing mysteries that were hidden among the stars for years. The cosmic race began decades ago. When we look back to the Cold War period, which started soon after the end of World War II and stretched into the 1980s, it's impossible to ignore the space race that was happening between the United States and the Soviet Union. Both superpowers were locked in a kind of competition, each trying to prove their superiority not only in military and political aspects, but also in technological and scientific fields. The frontier of space exploration became one of the main battlegrounds for this rivalry. Indeed, this was a time when many groundbreaking developments in space technology took place. The space race wasn't only about conquering the great unknown that is space, but also a symbolic theater where these two nations could demonstrate their technological prowess and potential to the rest of the world. The Soviet Union in particular was very keen to showcase its capabilities in this domain. A pivotal moment came in 1957 when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the world's first artificial satellite. This event was nothing short of revolutionary. The launch of Sputnik marked the beginning of a new era in space exploration. The tiny satellite, as it orbited the Earth emitting its distinctive beeping signal, had an enormous impact. It symbolized the start of a new race, a race not only towards the stars, but also for international prestige and recognition. But why was Venus the center of attention during this period? Well, Venus is our closest planetary neighbor. It's similar to Earth in many aspects, such as size and composition, which led to it being referred to as Earth's sister planet. However, as is often the case with siblings, there can be considerable differences. And the big question was how similar Venus really was to Earth. Could it possibly serve as a kind of second home for humanity out there in space? These questions intrigued scientists and the public alike, and the Soviet Union was determined to find the answers. Then began the era of Venera missions. The Soviet Union, in particular, launched a series of spacecraft called Venera to explore Venus. These missions were aimed at understanding the planet's atmosphere, surface, and overall conditions. In his book, Michio Kaku mentions the images of Venus from the Soviet Union's Venera probes, which were the first and only spacecraft to return images from the surface of another planet. To add more information to this topic, it's important to note that Venus was a target for many missions during this period. Now, exploring Venus isn't like taking a stroll in the park. The conditions there are extraordinarily harsh. We're talking about scorching temperatures that could melt lead, clouds teeming with sulfuric acid, and atmospheric pressure so intense it could flatten a human. But the Soviets were undeterred. They were ready to face these challenges head on. The first mission in this ambitious endeavor was Venera 1, which launched in 1961. However, it didn't exactly go according to plan. Instead of reaching Venus, Venera 1 ended up soaring past it by an enormous 62,000 miles. Rather than conceding defeat, the Soviet Union demonstrated remarkable resilience. They quickly rallied and launched Venera 2 the next year. Despite their efforts, though, Venera 2 followed in the footsteps of its predecessor and also failed to reach Venus. But as the saying goes, third time's a charm. The Soviet Union held on to this optimism and launched Venera 3 in 1965. This time, they struck gold. While Venera 3 didn't make a smooth landing, it crash-landed, in fact, it still managed to transmit valuable data back to Earth for a few brief minutes before succumbing to Venus's brutal conditions. This experience served as a turning point for the Soviet Union's approach to their space missions. They came to realize that to glean substantial data from Venus, their spacecraft needed some serious upgrades. They went back to the drawing board and redesigned their spacecraft to be more robust, packing them with cutting-edge tools. Each spacecraft was now equipped with a detachable pod known as a descent module. 
These modules were stuffed with an array of instruments, including a barometer, radar altimeter, gas analyzers, and thermometers. The idea was to collect as much data as possible in the short window of time the descent module could survive on Venus's surface. Now, let's circle back to the intriguing part of your question. What did the Soviets discover on Venus that they kept hidden? To answer that, we might need to delve into more historical data, examine the records of the subsequent Venera missions, and perhaps look at declassified Soviet space program documents. You see, the Venera missions didn't stop at Venera 3. The Soviet Union pushed forward with the next mission, Venera 4, and this one was a game changer. The craft managed to make it all the way to Venus's surface. But it wasn't just the fact that it landed that made this mission notable. It was what it discovered when it got there. Venera 4 found that Venus's atmosphere was absolutely packed with carbon dioxide. Now you might be wondering why that's significant. Well, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which means it traps heat in an atmosphere. With such a high concentration of carbon dioxide, it's no surprise that Venus has such high surface temperatures. We're talking up to 864 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun. This discovery was instrumental in understanding the climate and geology of Venus. And given the similarities between Earth and Venus, this discovery also gave us a glimpse into a possible future scenario for our planet, if greenhouse gases continue to accumulate in our atmosphere. In a way, Venus serves as a stark warning for Earth about the devastating effects of greenhouse gas accumulation. But the revelations didn't stop there. In addition to the carbon dioxide-rich atmosphere, Venera 4 also discovered that Venus lacks a global magnetic field. On Earth, we're protected by our magnetic field. It shields us from harmful solar winds and radiation. Without it, life as we know it would cease to exist. The fact that Venus doesn't have a similar magnetic field suggested that life, at least as we understand it, might not be possible there. This was a major insight into the formation and evolution of planetary magnetic fields and contributed to our understanding of the habitability of other planets in our solar system and beyond. So, with each mission and every piece of data gathered, we were getting closer to understanding not just Venus, but our own planet and the wider universe. These Venus missions were more than just feats of engineering and space travel. They were journeys of discovery that were deepening our knowledge of the cosmos. Sadly, Venera 4's mission was cut short. After about 90 minutes of data collection, the harsh conditions of Venus took their toll. The probe disappeared into the dense atmosphere of the planet, where the extreme heat and pressure rendered it inoperable. But those 90 minutes were far from wasted. The data collected was invaluable, giving us a unique insight into this mysterious planet. So, after the promising success of Venera 4, two more probes, Venera 5 and Venera 6, were launched towards Venus in 1969. These spacecraft were designed to be sturdier than their predecessor and were loaded with state-of-the-art scientific instruments to gather more precise atmospheric data. Venera 5 was launched on January 5, 1969. It had a similar mission profile as Venera 4, to plunge into Venus's atmosphere and gather data during its descent. As Venera 5 entered the Venusian atmosphere, it released a capsule containing a suite of scientific instruments. For 53 minutes, while the probe descended under its parachute, it transmitted valuable data back to Earth. This probe measured the chemical composition of Venus's atmosphere, the distribution of oxygen and hydrogen, the density of the atmosphere at altitude, and atmospheric lighting and temperature. Now, moving on to Venera 6, it was launched just five days after Venera 5, on January 10, 1969. Similar to Venera 5, it was equipped with instruments to study cosmic particle streams, determine the distribution of oxygen and hydrogen in the atmosphere, measure atmospheric pressure, determine the chemical composition and density of the atmosphere, and measure the atmospheric temperature. Venera 6 made its descent into the Venusian atmosphere on May 17, 1969, a day after Venera 5. During its descent, Venera 6 transmitted data back to Earth for 51 minutes. Although its photometer failed to operate, it was able to provide data on the Venusian atmosphere at 2 bars and 10 bars pressures. Both Venera 5 and Venera 6 were designed with smaller parachutes, given the dense atmosphere of Venus. 
This ensured that the capsules would reach their full crush depth before running out of power. The data from these missions reinforced the findings of Venera 4, confirming the high temperatures, pressures, and carbon dioxide composition of Venus's atmosphere. This made it pretty clear that Venus was not a hospitable place for life as we know it. And then came Venera 7 and Venera 8. They were part of the Venera series of probes aimed at exploring Venus, and they sent back some really important data to us here on Earth. Venera 7, which was launched back in August 1970, was a pretty groundbreaking mission. It was the first spacecraft to achieve a successful soft landing on another planet and transmit data back to Earth. The probe was designed with high pressure and temperature endurance, considering the harsh conditions on Venus. It was equipped with a bunch of sensors to measure temperature, pressure, and atmospheric density, along with an accelerometer and a radar altimeter. The journey to Venus took some time, and a couple of course corrections were made during the flight using the onboard engine. When it reached Venus in December of the same year, it had to enter the Venusian atmosphere. The entry was a bit tricky. The lander stayed attached to the bus during the initial stages of atmospheric entry to keep it cool for as long as possible. After it was ejected, the parachute opened but started to fail later, resulting in a more rapid descent than planned. This led to the lander hitting the surface at about 59 kilometers per H. Now, you'd think that was a mission failure, right? Well, not quite. Although the probe seemed to go silent upon impact, the recording tapes kept rolling, and a few weeks later, another 23 minutes of very weak signals were discovered on them. This meant that Venera 7 had indeed landed on Venus, even if it did bounce onto its side and aim the antenna wrongly for proper signal transmission to Earth. In its short time on the surface, the probe managed to send back data for about 20 minutes. It recorded a surface temperature of around 887 degrees Fahrenheit and estimated a pressure of about 1,300 psi. Moving on to Venera 8, which was launched in 1972, it was a similar mission but with some key differences. The probe was also designed to study Venus's atmosphere and surface, but the landing was a lot smoother this time around. Venera 8 was equipped with temperature, pressure, and light sensors, an altimeter, a gamma-ray spectrometer, a gas analyzer, and radio transmitters. The journey to Venus took about 118 days, with a mid-course correction made along the way. The descent capsule was pre-chilled before entering the atmosphere to prolong its life on the surface. Aerobraking helped reduce its descent speed from around 41,696 km per H to about 900 km per H, and the parachute opened at an altitude of 60 km. Venera 8 managed to transmit data during the descent, noting a decrease in illumination at 35 to 30 km altitude and wind speeds of less than 1 m per s below 10 km. The lander ended up touching down in what is now known as Vasilisa Reggio, in sunlight, about 500 kilometers from the morning terminator. After landing, Venera 8 continued to transmit data for a little over 50 minutes before it finally succumbed to the harsh surface conditions. It confirmed the high surface temperature and pressure data returned by Venera 7 and also measured the light level, finding it suitable for surface photography. The light level was comparable to an overcast day on Earth with about one kilometer visibility. Additionally, Venera 8's photometer measurements showed for the first time that the clouds on Venus end at a high altitude, and the atmosphere is relatively clear from there down to the surface. The onboard gamma-ray spectrometer also measured the ratio of uranium, thorium, and potassium in the surface rock, indicating that it was similar to alkali basalt. Both these missions, Venera 7 and Venera 8, brought about significant advancements in our exploration of Venus. Despite the challenges, including a less-than-perfect landing by Venera 7, the Soviets didn't back down. They analyzed the failures, learned from them, and used those lessons to refine their future missions. Thanks to the data beamed back by Venera 8, scientists came to understand that the atmospheric pressure on Venus was a staggering 90 times that of Earth's at sea level. Despite this oppressive pressure, the sensor on Venera 8 remained functional and provided valuable readings. In a groundbreaking discovery, the probe also recorded ambient light levels on the Venusian surface, suggesting the possibility of using cameras to capture visual data from the planet's surface. The Soviets weren't satisfied with just touching down on Venus. They wanted a first-hand view of what the planet looked like, which set the stage for future missions. 
From Venera 9 to Venera 12, the mission took on a new and exciting twist. These probes came armed with cameras capable of visually documenting the planet, offering humanity its first glimpses of Venus's intriguing, rough, and rocky terrain. These initial images weren't picture-perfect, but they brought to light a panorama of harsh, inhospitable landscapes punctuated by impact craters, sharp escarpments, and vast plains flooded by ancient lava. In 1981, Venera 13 and 14 followed, each more advanced than its predecessor. These probes had landers equipped with high-tech acoustic gear capable of measuring the speed of the winds blowing on the Venusian surface. However, the real game-changers were Venera 15 and 16. Instead of landers, these spacecraft were kitted out with robust radar-based imaging apparatus that could map the surface of Venus from an eccentric orbit. They offered a resolution of approximately one mile per pixel, providing scientists with detailed snapshots of Venus's topography and revealing the true nature of the planet's surface. Each new mission was like turning a new page in a book, every turn revealing more tantalizing information about Venus. Not every mission was a flawless success, of course. Many cameras on board these probes succumbed to the harsh conditions, but a handful persevered successfully capturing and transmitting the first-ever photographs from the surface of our solar system's second planet. In all their thorough exploration, the Venera probes found no signs of life on Venus. No oceans, lakes, or even a single droplet of water could be found on this desolate world. However, the probe's investigations yielded invaluable insights into the extreme environments of alien planets, enriching our understanding of how different these celestial bodies could be from our own Earth. While the absence of life might seem disheartening, the probes delivered many fascinating revelations. For instance, Venera 13 achieved a historic feat by recording the eerie sounds of Venus's winds. This marked the first time any sound had been captured on a planet other than our own, making it a memorable moment in our space exploration journey. Despite the challenges and setbacks, the legacy of the Venera probes lives on, continuing to inspire new endeavors to understand our celestial neighbors. But Venera 13 wasn't just about capturing the sounds of alien winds, it had more to offer. Initially designed to operate for just 45 minutes, the lander outdid itself and continued to work for an impressive 127 minutes on Venus's hostile surface. Throughout this extended operational period, it managed to capture and send back stunning color photographs of the planet, unveiling an austere and desolate terrain unlike anything we'd previously observed. But the surprises didn't stop there. Venera 13 also dug into the Venusian soil, or regolith, and analyzed a sample, this marked the first time humanity had analyzed the composition of another planet's soil. Through this exploration, we learned about the presence of elements like titanium and iron on Venus. It's truly amazing that we could gain such deep insights about a planet situated over 100 million kilometers away from us, especially considering that this took place in the 1980s. However, the more we learned about Venus, the clearer it became that it's highly unlikely to support life as we understand it. Venus's atmosphere is nearly 100 times denser than Earth's, and the planet's surface is subject to infernal temperatures. Far from being a tranquil, tropical paradise, Venus presents a daunting picture with its backward rotation and its lack of oceans or bodies of water akin to those on our blue planet. Despite these hostile conditions, we're not finished with our exploration of Venus. Russia's space agency, Roscosmos, is currently working on a new mission to Venus, named Venera D, which is slated for launch in 2029. This ambitious mission will include both an orbiter and a lander, and will serve as a template for subsequent Venus missions. You might be wondering why, given our understanding of Venus's hostile environment and its apparent inability to support life, we are planning further explorations. The answer is intriguing. It seems that not everything discovered about Venus during the initial missions was disclosed completely. There's more to unravel about this fiery planet, and this mystery fuels the drive for further exploration. In the early days of fall in 2020, a startling announcement was made by scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They had detected the presence of phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus. Why was this significant? Well, phosphine gas could potentially be an indicator of life. 
To add another layer of intrigue, there could be further evidence supporting this claim hiding in the data archives of a NASA mission from over 40 years ago. The mission in question was the Pioneer Venus Multi-Probe Mission, which took place in December 1978. This mission saw the release of four probes into the Venusian atmosphere, one of which was larger than the others and equipped with an advanced instrument called the Large Probe Neutral Mass Spectrometer, or LNMS for short. The primary role of the LNMS was to identify molecules in the atmosphere by gauging their speed as they collided with a detector. This device was primarily used to measure the presence of molecules such as carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and argon, which were already known to be present in the atmosphere of Venus. However, the sensitivity of the LNMS might not have been limited to detecting just these molecules. It might have also been capable of detecting others, including phosphine. Recently, Rakesh Mogul, a professor of biological chemistry at California State Polytechnic University, Pomona, decided to revisit the data collected by the LNMS. He stated, We dove into the data from the literature dating back about 40 years and think we've managed to identify some intriguing things. We believe that the evidence might suggest the presence of phosphine, this adds another layer of intrigue to the ongoing research into Venus and what it might potentially hold. Mogul puts forward an intriguing theory. He believes the scientists involved in the original mission might have overlooked the detection of phosphine. Why? They were primarily immersed in analyzing the general properties of Venus's atmosphere with a concentration on more widely known elements. Another theory he suggests is a little more enigmatic. The information was perhaps intentionally kept under wraps. This secrecy could have been a strategic move to gain an advantage over the rest of the world, notably the U.S., as the focus was majorly on Mars and other celestial bodies. Conceivably, while global attention was drawn elsewhere in the solar system, the team was potentially unearthing deeper insights from the trove of data collected from Venus. However, the actual scenario isn't as straightforward as it may seem. There's an overlooked detail that might be more significant than initially thought. If Mogul's interpretation of the Pioneer mission data proves accurate, it could provide swift validation for the recent detection of phosphine made by the MIT team. Yet not everyone in the scientific community is persuaded that the LNMS was sensitive enough to pick up on phosphine's presence. Mikhail Zolotov, a planetary scientist from Arizona State University, presents an alternative viewpoint. He proposes that what the LNMS might have detected is not phosphine, but a blend of gases rich in phosphorus and hydrogen sulfide. If phosphine was indeed detected by the LNMS, it could imply a far greater abundance of the gas than what the MIT team discovered. This discrepancy raises some eyebrows in the scientific community. Unfortunately, the opportunity to cross-check and verify these theories is presently inaccessible. The data from the Pioneer Venus multi-probe mission is carefully stored on microfilm at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. The archive is presently under restriction, meaning that, for now, no one can delve into the potentially revealing information it holds. Dr. David Williams, who currently holds the fort as the acting head of the NASA Space Science Data Coordinated Archive, indicates that they're working on securing permission to convert the microfilm into a digital format. This move will allow for a comprehensive examination of the data without having to handle the original physical records. The detection of phosphine stirred up quite a wave of excitement in the scientific community. This is because phosphine is a gas that can be generated by living organisms, which naturally brings up the tantalizing possibility of life existing on Venus. However, it's crucial to approach this with caution. This exciting revelation isn't definitive proof of extraterrestrial life on Venus. At least not yet. For us to confidently affirm the presence of phosphine on Venus, we need to gather more data. This could be achieved by dispatching atmospheric probes capable of detecting this gas directly or by scrutinizing the archived data from previous missions to Venus. The systematic collection and thorough analysis of more data will enable scientists to affirm the presence of phosphine. They can then make a more informed assessment about whether this gas is being produced biologically by living organisms or via non-biological processes. The validation of these findings is paramount. The notion of life on another planet is a revolutionary discovery that could redefine our perception of the universe and our role within it. However, 
In the pursuit of such groundbreaking discoveries, it's equally crucial to ensure the accuracy and reliability of the data before any grand proclamations are made. For this reason, scientists will persist in their quest to explore Venus and delve into its data. They hope to validate the presence of phosphine and uncover other potential indicators of life on Venus. If they succeed in doing so, it might just redefine the trajectory of space exploration. Attention could pivot back to Venus, with all sights set on uncovering evidence that could suggest the possibility of a planet akin to a second Earth. A discovery of such magnitude could potentially shift the way we look at our place in the universe and how we approach the quest for life beyond our home planet. What are your thoughts about it? Do you think Venus will be habitable to humans one day, or will Earth become Venus in the coming decades? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Stay tuned for more mind-bending videos.